Thank you so much, Adam. Thank all of you for coming out on a Friday night um, for this really important conference. And a lot of what you said really resonated with me. And so before I even begin on the typical track, I'm going to do my classic professor thing and immediately go off, off syllabus here and go off topic and just ask, how many people know how many people are on the planet right now? Does anyone have the number? Shout it out. 7.4 billion. All right, now we've got a nice mix of ages in the room, so let me ask you the next question. How many people were on the planet in the year you were born? Three billion. Three billion. That's right. This, well, unless somebody is, unless there's a baby in the room, there was nobody with seven billion. But um, <laughs> the, the answer is probably in this room spreads from about three to six billion. Because I saw a youngster out there somewhere. Otherwise, three to five billion. So I just want to put that context out there because I think that when you talk about hockey stick curves, one of the pieces of conversation that I hope comes up over the weekend is that additional piece, which is the population element, which is part of what's happening. All right. So that said, we're here to talk about the ocean, and I'm going to tell you something about it. Um, a little bit of context, I, as, I um, as Adam said, have been a research scientist at the New England Aquarium for the past eight years. Um, I've had a joint appointment and I'm now full time at Boston University. And I have spent the past 15 years really traveling globally and working um, in all parts of the oceans. Um, not all parts of the oceans, all parts of the tropical oceans. And I have the impossible task of introducing you to salt water this evening, which is um, such an honor and a really hard one to accomplish. So I'm going to start with the now classic beginning of most environmental talks these days with a picture of our planet. It is the blue planet after all. 70%, 71% of it is water. And this is my favorite view because there's no continents on this side. This is all the ocean. This is the Pacific. Um, of course, the ocean's very important. It, it feeds over a billion people. From, over a billion people derive their protein from oceans alone. Over 500 million people make their living off of the oceans alone. And um, some of the most beautiful oceans are right here in your backyard. Who in the room is from New England? Yeah, all right. We are not just cod and lobster. We have <laughs> beautiful, beautiful ecosystems that are right here. And when we talk about restoring oceans, I really want to point out um, Everybody always looks at the large megafauna. I'm going to draw your attention right here to these beautiful algae. Can you hear me still? Can I move? Yeah. I'm like a mover. Okay. Um, they're stunningly gorgeous, and they are really productive ecosystems. Kelp are really kelp and macroalgae systems really do a lot to draw down carbon, and they have a lot of carbon sequestration globally. And they also change seasonally, which is really important. New England is so beautiful and is home to such important ecosystems that they recently got um, and have been receiving a lot of attention for a long time from the conservation movement. This is a photo from Brian Scarry of Cash's Ledge. And I know you're going to hear about that a little bit more tonight, but I'll just put a prelude in and just say that this spot really deserves protection, admiration, and respect. Um, the Gulf of Maine, just from a climate perspective, just so you know, is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. We are feeling climate change in our oceans here in a way that we don't feel it everywhere else in the world quite yet. Also here in New England, we received recently our very first national um, monument in the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks to Obama just a mere few months ago, there was a massive expansion of ocean protection with Papahanaumokuakea out in Hawaii, and here the Northeast Canyons and um, uh, Seamounts National Monument, which is the first fully protected area here in the Atlantic. It's 130 miles off of Cape Cod. It's 5,000 square miles of underwater canyons and mountains. And in these incredible canyons is a wide diversity of invertebrate life, including corals. Did you know you had a coral reef 130 miles offshore? Because you do, and it's stunning. And re we only recently learned about it. If we turn our attention to the rest of the oceans, you'll see that there, there's incredible life everywhere. This is part of the Arctic Circle, which is the smallest of our five oceans, our five major oceans. Each one of these is unique. Um, for example, fun fact, um, the Arctic Ocean has some of the lowest salinity, but that is actually a product of where it sits and what it does. Um, it has some of the lowest evaporation, some of the least connections with other oceans, and has a large amount of freshwater inflow. So the same thing that makes it sort of a special ocean environment also increases its vulnerability in other ways. 
It's also home to some of the most incredible creatures on the planet, the narwhal, which are only in existence in our Arctic oceans. If we move to a completely different kind of place, you'll find yourself in the Mediterranean, which is surrounded by so much land with only a few small connections to the oceans writ large, that um, they are highly susceptible to all of the land features, things like runoff, pollution, point source, non-point source, everything that's happening around it um, impacts the ocean creatures in it. But the Mediterranean still is a unique and special place on our planet. The California kelp beds, they're just beautiful, but they're disappearing fast. There are estimates from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that 93% of the stunning ecosystem has shown decline from 2008 to 2014 alone. Their productivity, however, should not be discounted, and these are macroalgae, they grow quickly, which is a really hopeful piece of this. And so for as quickly as you've seen decline, there is the potential for regrowth. And speaking of regrowth and ocean ecosystems in this rapid world tour we're doing, I'd be remiss to talk about the large plants without talking about the small ones. Phytoplankton and zooplankton, phytoplankton in particular, are the backbone of everything that we know of in terms of life in the sea. They are abundant in the open ocean. They're the base of the food chain. These little critters, microscopic though they may be, support everything you know in the oceans. Our biggest whales, our largest sharks, all of our food fish, including tuna, which deserve mention for, their, for so many reasons, but the first I want to point out to you is that they're vastly beautiful. These are wild animals that we don't appreciate for their beauty the same way we see a cheetah or a giraffe, or I don't know, pick your favorite land animal. We just don't see tuna in anything other than a salmon, or a tuna roll, I guess I should say, right? And a piece of sushi. And so you don't see how stunning it really is. But this is a stunningly beautiful animal. It's powerful, it's fast, and it's highly overfished. But again, the future here is not completely over. Here are the eggs of this beautiful animal. And they are throughout tropical seas, and, and, and actually there's some Bluefins right here off the coast of New England, wells that are spawning, and they can recover if we give them the opportunity. They just need a completely different spatial scale. They cross large spaces. When we think about other parts of the ocean, for example, the Southern Ocean, otherwise known as the Antarctic Ocean, there are other sort of charismatic creatures that have captured all of our hearts. Um, of course, these are penguins, um, and they live here. Um, this is the space that holds 90% of the world's ice. Very important, of course, because if that ice melts, it means dramatic um, global sea level rise. Uh, I think up to 65 meters if all of the Antarctic ice were to melt. That said, people have recognized how important these spaces are. And have you guys heard this news? This just happened two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, the Ross Sea became the largest marine protected area on our planet. Actually, the large, largest protected area, land or sea, on our planet. It took 24 countries and the entire EU to come together and protect the Ross Sea, which is about as pristine of an ecosystem as you could possibly get. Not only the penguins, but the sea stars, the plankton, the entire ecosystem is now closed which is an unprecedented international and high seas initiative and effort. This region is important to the rest of the world, which is, I think, why so many countries were rallying, against, rallying behind it. First of all, of course, nobody owns the Antarctic. And the second reason is that um, the productive waters of the Ross Sea feed the rest of the world. And here's how they do it. They do it in this ocean circulation. I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is an ocean conveyor belt. It takes a thousand years, I think, for one drop of water to traverse the whole conveyor belt. But the results are clear. We have, we have water that is not isolated. It's interacting with the rest of the globe. And if you look at this from an ocean circulation model perspective, it's beautiful, but it's complex. I just want to show you something here. gives you a couple, uh, just a little bit of a sense of the complexity of our ocean currents and the patterns that we're talking about. And so when we talk about restoration about the oceans, we have to think of it almost on this scale because the ocean works on this scale. It's complicated and connected. Of course, we have to talk about coral reefs, which is the ecosystem I know best. This is a photo I took in Indonesia just a few years ago. 
Um, coral reefs are home to over 4,000 species of fish, over 800 species of coral. They provide a third of the world's protein for the majority of, um, you know, of, of the, from the ecosystem itself. They provide critical storm protection. They're highly biodiverse. There's a huge tourism industry, and they're beautiful. These ecosystems are also complicated. Almost everything you see in this picture is an animal. So these are not ecosystems that are familiar to people who walk only on land. We think of the world as plant-based, and it is, but when you're on a coral reef, it's animal-based. And so there are some fundamental differences, too, that need to be embraced in what these animals need and how they function and the way, the protections that we put in place. There's a lot of ocean wonder. These, I love coral reefs for their incredible diversity and they're, they're absolutely wild critters. This is a crinoid, this is an animal. You can sort of see its legs down there. It can swim, it can walk, it can't see. <laughs> there are stunningly beautiful critters that are so small. I mean, each one of these are itsy bitsy little pea-sized crabs. This is taken um, by a taxonomist friend of mine, Rob Lasley, who studies this particular guy who mimics uh, calcareous algae, a helamita, that it lives on. You'd never find it, unless you're Rob, because he's amazing, <laughs> really. These ecosystems house a ton of organisms, but you have to know where to look. I mean, you can find the fish, right? But underneath this matrix is, you know, contains all of the worms, all of the tunicates, all of the bryozoans, all of the invertebrate complexity that you would just, you can't see. It's almost like there are no, uh, there are so many fundamental differences between the oceans and the lands in terms of the way these ecosystems function. There are no roots here. But if you could look below the roots and look into the soil in a forest, if you looked underneath, inside the reef matrix, that's where you'd find all the good stuff, all the decomposers, all of the critters who are interplaying with each other and the nutrient cycling. That's where it all happens. Coral reefs are also, of course, home to vast tracts of fishes. And I show this to you. This is not a picture from 50 years ago. This is a picture from three years ago. And um, I've been in places like this as recently as three months ago. And so there are still places on our planet which are thriving and are beautiful and have hope. And I say this to you just before I depress you because despite all of that, there are spaces which are not doing well. These are coral reefs alone. This is the global decline of tropical reefs over the past few decades, and it's terrifying. It doesn't matter where you look, we see problems. And these issues um, that have caused the global collapse of tropical reefs have been by a number, for a number of reasons, and I, I like to say it's sort of death by a thousand cuts. Every single one of these things is a problem. Overfishing, climate change, pollution, sedimentation, disease, I mean, you could name it, name it, name it. And any one of these things, these systems are resilient. They probably could have handled to some extent, but pile them all on top of each other, and these e ecosystems are over overwhelmed. According to Reefs at Risk, more than 60% of the reefs are currently under immediate or direct threat. That said, here is my pick for the three biggest ocean threats of 2016 to think about in this conference. There are plastic debris, which is important for a number of reasons. One, there's byproducts of breakdowns of macroplastics, which are creating sort of a chemical pollution in the ocean. There's also microplastics, itsy bitsy flecks of larger plastic. Plastic that can break down from um, macroplastics or little plastic fibers that can come from your clothing, all of which that get imbued into the ocean and taken up by plankton and they can crash food chains. So we have to be really careful about that. Climate change, of course, is one of the big top three, ever increasingly so and overfishing, which has remained at the top of the list for a long time as a major threat. In fact, the ocean knows this and is either laughing at us or screaming, I can't tell, but here are the tunicates. Are the eyes, nose, mouth, break? <laughs> stop! That's what they're saying, just stop. And the problem is this, and it's really, you know, like Adam said, everyone's just doing what they do, being human, and I understand. So I teach students, and you know, I have children, and we go out into the field, and I show somebody something they've seen, and for the first time, they're a scuba diver, and they say, wow, this is gorgeous. Look at that huge coral. There's a couple of fish. This is stunning. This is why we save coral reefs, right? This is a po photo taken um, by David Arnold in 2013 from Turks and Caicos. But what they don't realize is that that same spot in 1980 looked so much better. And what I don't have is a picture from 1950. 
So there's this issue of shifting baselines. Again, oh my God, it's the most beautiful reef I've ever seen until you see what the reef looked like before. And so we're imprinting new generations of people on what the ocean looks like now, and there's still beauty to be had without any understanding of what the ocean used to look like. There's a quote by Greenpeace, actually, that I love. that says, the greatest wonder of the sea is that it is still alive. And it is. It really is. But we have to teach people that it's alive, but not necessarily thriving. There's a difference, and that difference is really important. So, I'm about to talk to you about a couple of other things, but I really want to show you this picture. This is Big Mama. One of these divers is me. This is the largest coral on the planet that we know of. She is 500 years old. She predates Columbus. She's in American Samoa, so she's going to be under the jurisdiction of our next administration. And she, protect her. And, um, she has put up with all that we've thrown at her so far, and I have every hope that she will continue to thrive. She's in a place called the Valley of the Giants with other corals nearly as large as she is. And the question is, how does she survive all of this? She did it. We got it. Come on, big mama. And so I'm going to take you now to a part of the, um, to one of the projects that I work on, which I think gives you some of the most, most ocean hope. It gives me some of the most ocean hope. So back to our planet. This is a picture we all know and love, right? You're on the side of the planet where everything's familiar. And then here's, what, um, here's where I work. This is the Pacific. It really is this big. This is really why they call us the Blue Planet. You can sort of see Hawaii, right? Let me orient you. Here's Hawaii. Good. Um, so here's where I work. X marks the spot. And I call it X marks the spot because it's where the international date line meets the equator, roughly. In the Pacific, this is next to it, really close. And. Um, where this is, is this is the Phoenix Islands protected area. It's that teal box in the middle, and it's a California-sized box. It's a box the size of California. It's huge, but it looks so tiny in the context of the whole Pacific. And it's owned and operated by um, the Republic of Kiribati, spelled Kiribati, which is a country that most of you have probably never heard of, but it's a really important country. It owns 33 islands spread across three archipelagos, right, which are sort of outlined in the white buffer zone on this, on this map. And the reason that buffer zone is so big is because the way international law works is each speck of land owned by Kiribati has a 200 mile exclusive economic zone around it. So this small island developing nation that you've never heard of owns enough ocean that's comparable in landscape to the continental United States. So if you wanna know where the ocean is, you go here. So this particular spot is a really important place. We've written a lot about it. I'm happy to share it with you, but I'll just sort of get over the, um, get the credentials out of the way. So I'm the chief scientist of this marine protected area. I chair their scientific advisory committee, and I liaise and coordinate all the scientists working in this California-sized box. It's an honor and a privilege to work on this project, but I don't do it alone, and that's why I say this. There's a lot of people who work on this with me. <coughs> But this place is really important to our planet. It is home to a bunch of open ocean systems. It is home to some deep sea um, ecosystems. It's home to a few terrestrial islands, eight of them in particular, and a whole lot of coral reefs. And for these exceptional habitats, it's actually currently the largest and deepest world heritage site on our planet. From a coral perspective, these are, this is a close-up of a coral. Corals are animals. I like to call them sea monsters because they're really animal, vegetable, and mineral all rolled into one. They create these skeletons, which is the mineral part. Here's the animal part. And inside of them are tiny little photosynthetic plants. And together, these sea monsters create the backbone of coral reefs. Um, those little plants, those dinoflagellate algae, are housed. You can almost see those little brown spots inside. That, those are they, inside the polyp. And um, these spots photosynthesize and produce produce um, most of the carbon for the calcium carbonate skeleton that a coral uses. And they are all at the surface. So here is a core of a deep coral, and you can see the brown part at the top is the only part of the top, at the top that's living. That's the living layer of a coral. Everything else underneath it is dead skeleton. And so corals are really at the surface. What you see is what you get, and that's why they're so fragile. When, that, when these dinoflagellates leave, corals turn white, and so that's what's called coral bleaching. And when that happens, when coral bleaching occurs, you lose your symbionts and you start a clock ticking. 
And that clock goes like this. The clock says, because corals don't immediately die when they bleach. The clock um, starts ticking where these corals have only the nutrients that they have stored in that top thin tissue layer. And if these algae come back in quickly enough and start to grow and, eat, and produce sugars again and carbon, these corals can survive. And if not, when they get to the point where they have no more energy left, they die. And so coral bleaching starts a clock ticking that can lead to mortality, but doesn't have to. And so that's what's really important um, when we think about coral bleaching. And here's the other thing about coral bleaching. Corals are not uniform. They don't not, there's you know, 800 species, they don't all do the same thing, and each individual doesn't do the same thing. Some species and some individuals can resist bleaching, and some can recover from it. So, back to my protected area, the Phoenix Islands protected area. Um, it sits in the middle of the Pacific, like I showed you, and that was, has been really important in the context of climate change, because here's what's happened. The left shows you 2002, 2010 and 2015, if you look at the band around the equator, you'll see that it was hot. This is sea surface temperature. Hot, hot, hot. And the Phoenix Islands sat in the center of it all three times, or in the middle of it. And sure enough, it bleached. There was massive, wide-scale bleaching. And so I'm going to tell you the story of one spot in particular, Coral Castles and Canton Island. And so I, I need to move. Uh, I'm going to just speak loudly. I hope you guys can hear me. So here's Hawaii. Here's Fiji. Here's the Phoenix Islands protected area. California-sized box. Eight islands. Only one of which is inhabited, by the way, with 34 people. The rest of this California-sized box is no people. 34 people in California. Yeah, great. Okay, so <laughs> one of those eight islands is Canton Island. And the island itself, this is really, you have to sort of get this, is just this ring around it. The inside is all water. It's the lagoon. Okay, this is a former sort of, this is called an atoll, so this used to be a volcano, the volcano sank down, this coral ring surrounds it, described by Darwin, this is how these, these islands form. And so this lagoon is really special, really, really special. Um, and so that's where I'm going to be talking about. And I'm talking about it just to give you, again, a sense of this California-sized box. Here's Canton Island, it's the largest one of all the islands. The rest of these islands, named in black, are just specks. Okay. So in 2000, in 2002, when we first explored it, so I didn't join the project until 2008, but when my predecessors first explored the Canton Lagoon, it looked like this. And these delicate tables of corals that overlay each other um, are suggestive of the fact that this ecosystem was intact or hadn't been disturbed in a long time because they're fragile. And had they been disturbed, they would have crumbled. So remember I showed you the globe. There was a massive coral bleaching event in 2002 and 2003. And after that, this is what the Canton Lagoon looked like. 100% mortality. In 2015, a mere 10 years later, it looked like this. Alive and thriving again. And here's the graph. Here's the data, right? Really steady march back up. And this is fast. This is really fast for coral reefs to thrive. All right, and then we had 2015, which was again the third um, global bleaching event. And here's the Phoenix Islands trajectory. So this is a plot put out by NOAA as part of their Coral Reef Watch. I'm going to show you a little bit of data here, but here's time, months going to the bottom, 2015, 2016. This, I just took this today, so here's where we are, right, mid-November. And during the 2015 bleaching event, this is um, degree heating weeks, and here's the temperature, and the Phoenix Islands were hot. They were at the highest alert level. Everyone was sure that all that recovery was just going to be gone. Except that it looked like this in August of this year. So it survived that incredibly hot temperature. And the world cared, by the way. We were really proud to have gotten an NPR story and a New York Times. We were the cover of the Science Times. And um, we were really excited about this. And we had to put it immediately into the context of what was happening elsewhere in the globe, which is that not every reef was so lucky. The Great Barrier Reef, for example, was just pronounced dead, apparently. I mean, it's not really dead. But I'll say that it's still in the ICU. So why do some reefs survive while others die? And what, how do you protect the oceans? We look at a disturbance, and 
what's happening, what I showed you in the Canton Lagoon, this is the forest equivalent, right, is that ecosystems can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until they reach a stable community again. It's called succession. And when this happens, we, it happens a lot on land, we have a pretty clear idea of what the indicators are, of how it works, of how regrowth looks like. When we see good things come back in, what the rate of that regrowth is, um, what the diversity of that regrowth looks like in different regions of the world, we actually have a really good understanding of this on land. We have a terrible understanding of it in the oceans. We have no clue. And so we're starting very slowly to try to understand this by taking millions of pictures of the bottom, stitch them together in large maps. We, I do this in collaboration with some folks at Scripps and Woods Hole. And we look at every single coral and we look at their change over time and we look at their spatial relationships to each other. And so you can, for example, see here's, if you kind of look at the thing that looks like a challah bread, right, in the upper, upper left, you can see the same coral through time. This is a mere three years difference. We can watch how some corals survive and how some fail. We can look at recruitment. These are baby corals. This is a new recruit, probably just one year old. This is a toddler, this is a teenager. Okay, and they are all growing on a sea of pink. And pink is really great. Pink is crustose coral and algae. And this is the substrate that corals need to grow on. So we're beginning to get a sense of what restoration looks like, of how regrowth, what, what that looks like. Succession, um, recovery. And we are just at the beginning of this work in the science field. And it's really complicated. But nonetheless, even though we're still just trying to understand this, we know that we need to protect it. So and I, I'm gonna wrap up and just say, how do we restore the oceans? because that's really the theme of this conference. Well, I restore them. My particular role is with the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. Like I said, we work with the Science Advisory Committee, the collaborators, with the Conservation Trust, three different groups. These are the people who make this happen. We fly all over the world and we meet with each other and we work with small governments and large governments. And um, I mean, I'm a scientist. This isn't, I wasn't trained to work with governments, but this is what we really have to do if we want to influence conservation. And I do it because I'm a coral reef scientist interested in recovery but it has other implications. This is our California-sized box. Before it was fully closed, each one of those white dots is a fishing vessel prior to closure. And here's what it looked like after closure. So we protected coral reefs, but we also protected a spawning area for tuna. And we have a space that might be quieter for whales. And we have a space that gives it the plankton a chance to regenerate and the deep sea a break. And there's no opportunity for deep sea mining to even start because it's now it's fully protected. And the coral reefs and the seabirds and the lagoon habitats and the clams and the large reef fishes and the sharks from shark finning. And so protection happens with just a few small people. Really, that wasn't a whole lot of people. That was a total of 50 people, right, who were working to work on a single space. And so here's the real question. How do you restore the ocean? The answer is different for everybody, but I'm going to let you in on my favorite tip. Everybody here and everybody in the entire world lives in a watershed, and every watershed influences the ocean. So this is a map of the United States watershed. You can take a look at the Mississippi River watershed. And I would really hate to be an oyster living here <laughs> right now. But everywhere you are, I, I, hate, I hate it when I run into people and they say, God, I love the oceans. I wish I could do something for them. But I live nowhere near an ocean. Yes, you do. There's a transport system <laughs> right in your backyard that leads you to an ocean somewhere. And so I always like to tell people that it sort of almost doesn't matter how you get started. It just matters that you do, that you get started and do something. It almost doesn't matter what you do first. It just matters that you do something. And it almost doesn't matter where you live. It just matters that you keep an environmental context. Because the same thing that you do to save monarch butterflies or I mean, pick your favorite species, right, or ladybugs or you know, the California condor is also going to be the same things that you're going to want to try to do to save the ocean and save our waters. And it's really important. This is another incredible graphic. This is, this blue ball on the top represents all of the water total on planet Earth. And the smaller one is the liquid freshwater and the itsy bitsy tiny speck, which I don't even know if you can see, is the freshwater that's only in lakes and rivers. So we have 70% of our surface planet as water, but this is really all there is. And so everything that we do touches the water cycle. And so everyone has a role to play. And that makes me really hopeful. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you. Thank my lab, our funders, and the people I work with.